Our evening, I'm going to have a little adventure in symbolism. So that's what you try to clarify. And many books could be written about. He went in the first of this series of discussions that alchemy was at least to a degree a breaking forth of the spirit of mysticism which had been lost in the hearts and minds of three Renaissance men. The breakdown of the tremendous domination of the aristocracy and the clergy resulted in the beginning of emotion towards intellectual liberty. And in the transition period, we had about two centuries in which mystical movements developed and expanded in an astonishing manner. We know that, this, that these movements came directly from a movement within man himself. And in this we come to a very important and interesting problem. How does the human being think? Does he think in words, in pictures, or in your ideas. I think we learn from the study of persons changing languages that a great many human beings think in words. And we know, for example, that in the study of language, you must labor along a difficult and unfamiliar path until you begin to think in the language which you are studying. And then suddenly the words become meaningful and available. I know persons who have lived in this country for many years and speak English language well, but in a hurry they will count in their native language. Therefore there is a certain association between thought and words. It is probable that the intellectualist thinks in the terms of words, because he uses them constantly. They are the familiar instrument of self-expression in the language. It is also quite possible that the artist, the peculiar aesthetic individual, may think in form, or in color, or even in tone, as in the case of the musician. Thus the origin of thought patterns may differ with different persons. And the basic chemistry of thought pattern probably differs also in the male and female. Thus, we are confronted with an intricate issue of the basic form of ideas within ourselves. Studies in anthropology and ethnology lead us to the recognition of the universality of certain essential emblems and figures. I had a letter yesterday, which, strange enough to report, I answered today. It does not very often happen. Relating to a tomb recently discovered at Palanque in uh, uh, Mexico, in Chiapas. Palanque is one of the old centers of the Maya culture. This tomb was the physical remain, mostly dust of some ancient dignitary of the empire. And in the disintegrating and ruinous state of the mortal remains of this person, it was noted that in one hand of the deceased had been placed a small sphere of jadeite, and in the other hand a small cube of jadeite. There are also many other ornaments of precious and semi-precious materials. The letter asked why <coughs> those two jadeite ornaments should have been associated with the dead. Well, there are several possibilities. The cube of the sphere was early associated with architecture, and uh, similar remains were found within certain of the pyramids in Egypt. They were used for the simple process of laying a foundation. But the builder was not sure whether his levels were 
clear and right. He would stir the cube on a flat place on his wall, place the sphere on top of it. If it rolled off, then he had another level foundation. Now this peculiar relationship caused these little <coughs> instruments to be associated with the craft of building. We have the remnants of them today in the Summit Country Square. The compass makes a circle and the square measures a cube. So we're back again to the concept of the sphere and the cube. One representing the sphere, life, spirit, consciousness, the cube, matter, body, earth. <coughs> but that these should be placed in the hands of this deceased aristocrat of the old Maya Empire may have been one of several things. Perhaps he was a priestly architect, bearing with the insignia of his profession, because architecture was an important craft in art among these people. Perhaps he was a priest philosopher architect, one who had received the proper recognition as a master builder <coughs> of men, or a custodian of truths. Perhaps it was an ancient symbol that the body returns to the earth from which it came, the cube, and the spirit returns to Don Gaelic, the sphere. Certainly, however, these symbols were there. They are in China. They are in India. They are in Egypt. They are in Greece. They are among all American Indians. Why these symbols? <coughs> we have two uh, possibilities in explanation. One, the migration of the symbol itself. Namely, in some remote period, certain basic cultures that have now perished were much more, more broadly disseminated around the earth than we realize. And as we follow certain migrations, such as the bone arrow migration or the swastika migration, we find these symbols traveling with the motions of people to the primitive world, passing from one culture group to another. The second possible explanation lies in the internal development of man himself, by which consciously or unconsciously he creates symbols which have an essential identity, which have an essential consistency. And when he thinks about certain things, he always thinks of the same symbols, regardless of where he is or to what culture he may belong. Therefore, a symbolism may rise to the unfolding human culture. And the symbols the same or essentially similar may appear at many different places because unfolding human beings reach certain cultural levels. And when they reach these levels, they'll instinctively release these symbols through themselves. <coughs> now this has an interesting meaning for us because in our present consideration, health, we find the greatest conglomeration of symbols that were ever probably brought together in the service of a single idea of doctrine, science, or art. Yet these symbols are not essentially original with alchemy. There is perhaps not a single symbol in alchemy that can be traced directly to the period in which it began to flourish in that usage. <laughs> these symbolisms are derived from practically every previous culture that man developed. From Egypt, from Greece, Rome, India, China, all of these ancient systems use the same symbol. It makes very little difference whether it is the dragon of alchemy, or the dragon of St. George of Cappadocia, or the dragon of China. These dragons are all the same. The same may be said of the unicorn, or of many other similar devices, the double-headed eagle, for example which occurs in so many, many places. The symbolism of fire, and of water, of earth, and of the elements does not belong to alchemy. But alchemy made use of it. So we are in a more or less peculiar situation. We are trying to explain why certain symbols became associated with a cult or a sect of persons engaged in a particular art or science. Certainly there is nothing in the subject of chemistry itself which suggests such a phantasmagoria of devices. 
and modern chemistry with great efficiency depend almost entirely upon comparatively elementary mathematical symbols. Yet in this day it was different. In the 16th and 17th centuries, we have some of the most magnificent manuscripts ever illuminated uh, by the human hand. None of the quality of the great works of art which preceded them, but of a fantastic imagery which gives them a dynamic <coughs> a significance and importance causes them to be one of the most valuable and prized group of manuscript materials. <coughs> Why? Let us assume for a moment, <coughs> or what we must assume at this time, that alchemy was, as its name implies, a divine kind of chemistry. Man had here upon a truth which he had long held with veneration, but had never explored. And that truth was that each art and science is dependent upon a great pattern of universal laws for its validity. These laws are infinitely repetitive in nature. Da Vinci in his aesthetic canon shows how the body is composed of an infinite repetition of certain basic forms. Knowledge is composed of an infinite repetition of basic patterns on various levels. Alchemy defies the belief or develops the belief that the laws governing chemistry were identical with the laws governing every other phenomena in nature. That to understand chemistry to its very source was to understand creation. That creation and chemistry were intimately related that man is a chemical formula <coughs> and an alchemical mystery. That the human body is not only composed of chemical elements, but contains within itself a being composed of alchemical elements. <coughs> what is true of the body on one level is true of the soul on another. And the entire economy of human life is a tremendous formula, <coughs> a formula that may be traced under certain conditions. A certain formula is itself a kind of catalyzing agent. We know that Baron Emanuel Swedenborg was led to his own inner mystical and spiritistic experiences through the study of mathematics. Mathematics opened in him something. And to another group, chemistry opened suddenly. Through concentration upon the rules and principles of chemistry, the chemist gradually became internally apperceptive of something beyond the subject under consideration. He released something through himself. And that which he released came to his objective consciousness in the form of symbols, as is still the case so frequently in the releases of various subjective pressures in dreams. As you have pointed out, all alchemical symbols are found in dream symbolism also. And they are found in the dreams of persons who have the slightest concept of what alchemy is, and perhaps have never in their lives seen an alchemical symbol. Yet of themselves, their dreams took these very same forms. And we are led, therefore, to the implication that certain forms are archetypal, that they rest in the collective unconscious of our race, that they are part of something, as we may say, that, are, that is larger than we are. And we find these symbols occurring in three ways. We find them coming through in dreams. We find them coming through in esoteric arts and sciences, which is in journalism. And we find them coming through in folklore, tradition, and legend. Always the same symbols. Legendary is a kind of symbolism. 
emerging from man himself, who traces his own origin beyond the objective into a subjective. And in this tracing goes back into a layer of symbolism within his own nature. Now we have in the Arabian Nights Entertainment a kind of romantic picture story <laughs> which could well look like a leaf from an alchemical manuscript. We have in the legends of the age of chivalry, of the Greeks, of the Egyptians, of the Hindus, the Chinese, the appearance of, the, of mysterious, fantastic creatures and beings. We also immediately call upon one of the most common of all of these symbols, and that is the hero. The mysterious being possessed of supernatural power, but not a god. Where would folklore be without the hero? Where would the story of the Aladdin's life be without Aladdin and the lamp? Where would the wanderings of Sinbad the sailor lead to without their mysterious complications? or Homer's story of the wanderings of Odysseus. <laughs> Always these hero legends involve transcendental powers, demons, saints, gods, godlings, and a hero with magic instruments, a shield of strength, a sword that soothes, a, a charm <coughs> of invisibility, all these things are part of fairy story, legendary and law. They are all diffused, diffused and diversified throughout the entire structure of human society. Now we may say, why did the alchemist hit upon this peculiar fantasy of symbolism? There is no doubt that the answer lies in the nature of his own mind and the time to which he lived. Quite removed, for instance, from the immediate speculations of alchemy, was that very studious, very dour old gentleman, Father Athanasius Kirchhoff of the Society of Jesus. He was a typical example of a 17th century scholar. He was within the body of the church, but he was wedded first to knowledge. This strange scholar was one of those who recognized or felt what it meant to break through the strange pattern which was broken uh, by the Renaissance and the Reformation. Kirchhoff immediately searched in every department and every bracket of culture for knowledge. The Museum of Kirchhoff in Rome was for centuries a place where you could see everything from Egyptian gods to stuffed crocodiles. All knowledge was his promise, a tremendous hunger, a hunger that reached out to try to find meaning in everything. At the time of alchemy arose, this hunger was strong in European thinking. Noble princes had their cabinets, as they called them, their choice little museums in which they have gathered the antiquities and relics of ages. Men pried everything that was new or different, or which had previously been inaccessible to them. They speculated on Egyptian glyphs. They tried to restore the medical system of Hippocrates. They collected and assembled Gnostic gems. They had many Indian, Chinese, Japanese idols, not as objects of worship, but as mysteries and curiosities. This opening of the door sent man's mind scurrying in every direction in search of knowledge. And he was overwhelmed by the tremendous inflow of tradition that poured in upon him the moment he was able to receive it. As soon as he could read and write, a vast pageantry of ideas moved in upon him. An alchemical symbolism leveled off almost completely as being based upon the, the tradition available to 17th century man if he possessed the faculties and means of attaining it. Scholarship became a fetish. Learning became something that 
even the most superficial dilettante, devoted his life to. There was a tremendous upsurge in the desire to know. And what was available to the man who saw? The ruin of the past. Broken monuments, this desecrated altar. Broken images, strange figures, far human, far animal, found in the ruins of Egypt. Many incredible devices, the real meanings of which he did not know. He could not read the glyphs of Egypt, the Rosetta Stone had not been discovered. But the less he knew about these things, the more tremendous their influence was. Because he then bestowed meaning upon them. And in bestowing this meaning, he was constantly drawing it out of himself. Each of these unknown objects of his contemplation called upon him, demanded something from him, and also gradually revived tradition, myth, and legend in him. So here was a, a tremendous amount of raw material available to create thinking patterns in human minds. Now another angle we shouldn't overlook is the relationship between internal patterns and external stimuli. Relations which we may term associational. We have today in psychology association word tests. A word is spoken and the person taking the test is supposed to instantly reply with the word that first comes to his mind. Association. Now let us assume for a moment that the human being moving from within himself is impelled by the pressure of ideas. <coughs> now, an idea is a pretty simple thing that gets a look at. It doesn't have many boundaries, it doesn't have much of a shape. It is more elusive than an amoeba when it comes to trying to find a definition for it. It's a sort of a mysterious, shapeless something that has existence without um, appreciable or measurable boundaries. There would be nothing less useful to man than a free idea in space. <laughs> he wouldn't know what to do with it. He wouldn't know if he had it. He wouldn't know if he lost it. Because all there is there is something that is alive and yet has no body. And because it has no body, intellectual, emotional, or physical, it is utterly intangible and yet it exists. A man will never permit an idea to remain in that state. He, he, it's instinctively impossible for him to do so. Somewhere in the process of the emergence of thought impulse from within his own nature, he meets the outcoming or outpouring thought with a series of vessels suitable to contain it in some way. He must invest it with body. He must give this idea a form so that he can get hold of it. Perhaps he gives it a word form. Perhaps he doesn't. Much of this symbolism could be uh, almost immediately cleared up. If we saw a man struggling from the hieroglyphic to the hieratic period in writing, man could draw pictures of things, but he could not draw pictures of ideas. He could draw a beautiful picture of a house, but how was he going to draw a picture of love? He hadn't hit upon that happy thought of a heart with an arrow. <laughs> <laughs> how was he going to draw a picture of veneration? Well, the only thing he could think of was to make a figure in a position of veneration. If he wanted to show uh, imagination, he had to use something uh, that was suggested, an image, or a mirror, or some device appropriate. And yet even that, in that case, he wasn't sure how he was going to carry on uh, the transmission of this idea. The Mayas, for example, who we just mentioned, had quite a problem with verbs. And the verbs are always difficult in a hieroglyphical language because they represent action. And pictures do not move. Pictures do not possess action. It must be intimated in some way. A little series of footprints going along to try to show that a man is taking a walk. The mind is upon the simple device of taking a noun or a glyph representing an object and transforming it into a bird by adding a wing. 
They put a wing like the wing of a bird on the side of it to indicate action, to indicate life. But it was no longer an object but a process or a condition in action which they sought to represent. <coughs> now the development of languages shows us how these things happen. But how rapidly they happen in the development of an idea within man. The idea itself is <coughs> presented to him as well as to others. In its pure form, it is a ray of energy. He must clone it. Now he cannot clone it with something that he knows nothing of. To clone an idea in an unknown form is inconceivable because man cannot conceive of an unknown form. Any form that he can conceive of must exist. Furthermore, he is confronted with another immediate problem. Forms are of two kinds. Forms suitable for the expression of facts on a level of existence as we know it. Houses and trees and dogs and cats. These do not offer any great amount of problem. But man frequently wishes to represent in an idea something essentially transcendent. Something which is not of this world worldly. He has to break the familiar pattern in order to present an unfamiliar idea. How do we do it? He takes familiar things and puts them into an unfamiliar arrangement. The only method that he has. He recognizes not only that in so doing, he saves his idea from being misinterpreted, and also he creates an impact by it, which is missing in familiar things. Therefore, we can say that an eagle he can use. An eagle can represent a number of things. But everyone who sees it says this is an eagle, and he means a real eagle. So what does the man do with an idea? He makes a two-headed eagle. In so doing, he has immediately broken away from reality. <coughs> Your impressionistic artist is trying to do it constantly. The man who sees the two-headed eagle immediately says to himself, there is no such a bird. Therefore, this does not mean the bird. It means something else. It has to. So we break through realities of a literal nature and escape into the imagery of idea. Now, every one of us growing up is in contact with the world around us. We are also under the pressure of the world within us. When we begin to think of good as small children, we can't think of good as just as something good. Good has no meaning. Good has to be immediately associated with the act of goodness. <coughs> or some person or thing which we can use to appreciate goodness. So perhaps the small child in a strong and happy family environment experiences good under the symbol of parent. Parents good to it, takes care of it, protects it. That's good. Another man may interpret good under the form of fine, well balanced dinner. That's good. Good, however, always has to come to us under symbolism because it's an abstraction. The good Samaritan <coughs> is the good deed. <coughs> Now, a good deed without some symbolism by which you see what a good deed is, is meaningless. Yet instinctively, the moment we have the term good deed come into our mind, the abstraction takes the form of some good deed that we have known, experienced, or heard about. We immediately clone this thing ourselves in a familiar term in a familiar word picture, or a familiar form picture. We use distortion exactly as Michelangelo used distortion to create a dynamic. If Michelangelo's figure of Moses stood up, we would see that it was a totally disproportionate figure. Yet because of his arrangement of mass, it gives us a tremendous dynamic, which is the thing that he is trying to do, Western. 
where by distortion we dramatize. We escape from liberality, from smallness, from ordinariness, and transcend into something else. The Greek and Egyptian priest put a mask over his face. The moment he did so, he was no longer a person, he was a god. And he not only caused others to think so, but he thought so. Because of the ritual of the mask and his own belief that this sacred symbol transformed him. So that the, the action of the departure from the real, from the literal, by the use of fantasy, has been primitive in mankind and, and has been there since the beginning of time. So in our alchemical symbolism, we find a group of emblems at vanish arising out of certain great archetypal patterns experienced by the human being. And he, in his own effort to experience things superior to material facts, began to clothe instincts, impulses, ideas, inspirations from within himself in certain forms. If he had clothed them in ordinary forms, they would have appeared ordinary. But he did not want them to appear ordinary because these stories he was telling were not ordinary. And then he placed them in mathematical ciphers, which he well knew. He would then have been on the level of chemistry itself, which is not what he wanted to do. He wanted to tell you of chemistry as an experience of consciousness and not as a series of scientific formulas. He was working for a consciousness dimension. Just as Michelangelo wished to convey the terrific impact of the great mosaic lawgiver in his Moses. He wasn't trying to be an, a master of anatomy. <coughs> he had to be a master of anatomy to do what he did. He wanted to create something that was unworldly and had a dynamic strength beyond that of man. Therefore, he fashioned it in a way that instinctively related into the experience of the person seeing it, this unreality, that is, the lack or absence of complete physical integration, something beyond physical things. Now, <laughs> so in his day, he did not have a great deal to work with. The alchemists, like Michelangelo, had the human body. Like certain of the great uh, religious mystics, he had the scriptures. He used them. Like certain great artists, he had the entire art pageantry of a dozen nations. He made use of all of these things. But primarily, his purpose was to tell us from the beginning <coughs> that he was transforming formulas into living patterns, clothing them in symbolism, which broke reality, broke objective reality in the sense of the everyday, the mediocre, the commonplace, the familiar. Familiar symbols for familiar ideas. But for an idea that cannot become familiar, which is strange to us, an unfamiliar symbol, <coughs> or one that breaks the common patterns of things. The Egyptians were masters of it, and a large part of alchemical symbolism is based upon the hieroglyphics of Apollos Neos, one of the last of the old Egyptian hieroglyphic uh, compilers who had records of these old glyphs and symbols. Your emblem writers of the Middle Ages, your emblemists, did the same thing. Your emblemists took morality and changed it into symbols, just as your alchemists took science into it. So the psychology of this thing is this release of the unfamiliar, which must clone itself in a form which breaks conservative recognized patterns, because these patterns would drown the idea. And, that, and from this reason, they call upon the great magical <coughs> symbolism of antiquity, which in itself gave a tremendous sense of unreality. 
The Minotaur of Crete, the human being with the head of a bow. There is an impact there. We know it cannot mean a physical, factual thing. It breaks the familiar. So does the dragon of Andromeda. It breaks the path. We are away from worldliness. We are in a different kind of a universe, a universe of fantasy, a universe of fairy tale and folklore, an inner universe, a universe of subjective things, where the consciousness forms and fashions ideas. In the same way, we release them through dreams. Those dreams must not be factual completely. They must have an element of fantasy because they represent internals rather than externals, and we can only symbolize them through chemistry. <coughs> Alchemy, then, is trying to tell us of the experience of chemistry, of what chemistry means to an individual who, come, who receives a total impression of it as an experience of consciousness. He experiences it as a dynamic, not as merely a science or an art. He experiences it as a transformation or a transmutation of his own existence. Here is your mystical dimension coming in, which is probably the most important dimension in the alchemical symbolism. <coughs> now, this is a sort of an elaborate preamble, but it is more or less necessary to set our pattern. Now, let's see what some of these symbols were. Some are familiar, some unfamiliar. But even the familiar ones mingle into an unfamiliar pattern. And unfamiliar ones become so well known to us that they seem like old friends before we get through. This symbolism derives itself from a basic authority. The authority of instinct, the authority of childhood, the authority of the primitive and direct impulses of man's own patterning procedure. So we might not be surprised to find in alchemy two symbols that must immediately appear. One is the king and the other the queen. Now the king, of course, is an experience that every human being has had. <coughs> the king is the boss of any level in any way you want to look at. The king is leadership, rulership. The king is law. The king is order. The king is power. And there isn't the most uh, mild and uh, apparently uh, unambitious member of the proletariat who does not secretly in himself know that he is the king. <laughs> Every man is a little king. He's modest about it sometimes, by choice, more often by necessity, but he's <laughs> <laughs> The king is also, of course, God. Because God represents the supreme ruler. We never will never forget that little book of Clarence Day, God and Father. <coughs> Much in common. But the king is also, in a mysterious way, our instinctive recognition of a power that reposes within the universe, within ourselves. The king is life. Rules everything. The king is power, life, truth, life. The king is the universe in which we live. We are his subjects. The king is spirit, the master of the great core of the universe. The king is nearly always beyond and above and superior. <coughs> The king is heaven in China. Therefore, the king represents a great positive polarity. The king is not only something we fear, something we must obey whether we will or not, it is something, furthermore, that secretly we admire. When we are happy, we wish the king would leave us alone, but when we get in trouble, we rush to him for help. We do not like to have him boss us, but we are constantly hoping he will save us. The king is will, the sovereignty, 
of an active agent in the universe. Now the opposite polarity to this is the queen. And the queen has always been associated with the broad concept of creation itself. Father, God, and Mother Nature. The queen represents, to a very large measure, the entire environmental life of the individual. The king is self. The queen is everything else. The queen is the universe, which man, self, desires to possess. Therefore, every move we make reminds us of Gaby's immortal lines, the eternal feminine lures us on. The eternal feminine is the unknown. And to conquer and capture and to possess the unknown is the great ambition of man. And science fiction, as we have it today, with all kinds of fantastic stories about other dimensions of rays and energies and <coughs> weird creatures from other worlds, they're all the story of the king searching for the queen, seeking to possess the unknown. Most uh, peoples have referred to their own lands, their continents, their homes as their mother. The, the Mother Earth, Mother India, Mother China, the Motherland. Occasionally, some nations refer to it as the Fatherland. And here again, we come into some intricate symbolism. And most countries that have a Fatherland have a psychology that is quite different from those that have a Motherland. We mustn't forget that these things work together in a very important symbolism. So in the great alchemical empire, we have the king and queen ruling over the entire picture. Now the king comes back to us again from one of the most mysterious and enigmatical pursuits of mankind, and that is the game of chess. Because in the game of chess, we are not only playing the game of war, but we are playing the game of life. Now in the game of life, the queen can be taken, but not the king. In other words, the king is never captured in a game of chess. He is placed in a condition or a position in which he cannot move without jeopardy, and that constitutes checkmate and is the end of the game. You can't take him. You, uh, you destroy him by preventing him from moving. You cannot take him away. Now, as you think a little bit, you begin to see how that plays into another idea. Very intriguing. You cannot capture spirit, but you destroy his power when you prevent his motion. You cannot destroy truth but you prevent its power when you no longer permit it to have circulation, or to be disseminated, or to be spread or interpreted. You destroy things by destroying their action, but you cannot destroy the reality of anything, which is always the case. So we have as in China, Father Heaven and Mother Earth. And you have man created between these by the action one upon the other forming the great Chinese triad, have a earth and man. Now what is man? In the alchemical tradition, man is Mercury. Now you may not all recognize yourself as this delightful little character with wounds on his heels and on his head. But, he, and carrying the cross, the celebrated Caduceus, usually dressed in the garb of a Roman soldier. Very important part of symbolism. But Mercury is the beloved son of the king and queen. Now, when you make the king and queen an alchemical symbolism, you have several ways of doing it. One way is to show the king as a human body with a crown, but instead of the face, the face of the sun. And the queen, a woman with a royal crown, but instead of her face, the face of the moon. So that the king and queen become the sun and moon. 
and the sun and moon in alchemy are gold and silver. But not the gold and silver that we see, says by some of Valentine and Valentinus, but an invisible gold and silver. The two precious rulers of the metals, the king and queen of the world of the metals. Therefore, we have another mysterious point, namely that Mercury is the son of gold and silver. He is the child, not only as the deity, but as the element. Now, what is Mercury? Mercury is quicksilver, and was so called. Mercury is Hermes, from the root of Herm, fire. Mercury is the most volatile and the most catalytic of the elements in the alchemical symbolism. Mercury is the only element that can accept into itself all elements and reconcile them. So man becomes the power, the only element or the only matter, which can bring about within himself the fusing of the metals, or to act as the common denominator of metals. And yet it is not Mercury as we see it, but a volatile spirit of Mercury that must be used in this <laughs> mystery. So we have a mysterious combination of king, queen, and son. That is, as Orion, composed of sun, S-U-N, moon, and Mercury. <coughs> now another way of calling the sun, moon, and Mercury is to say salt, and uh, say sulfur, salt, and quicksilver. And these are a formula. For all of the great achievements, the great stone of the wise is composed of salt, sulfur, and mercury, also the universal medicine. Now we have learned that the king is something that can never be taken. The, the king is the absolute ruler but things can happen to him. He can appear to die. He can be destroyed or attacked by his own son, but he cannot actually be killed. We'll find out a little more about what can happen to him in the alchemical game of chess a little later. At this moment, we also have another symbol that presents itself to us, and that is what is called the Hermetic Androgyne. This is the royal figure of the king and queen as one person with two faces, one male and one female, and a single crown over the double head. Here we have heaven and earth as one. When so represented, the symbol of Mercury is usually in the middle of the body of this combined androgenic creature. So we now have gold and silver undivided. We have God and nature undivided. We have the sun and moon united in the hermetic marriage of the planets. We now have the God Ishvara concept of India, the father mother God undivided. This actually represents the supreme representation of the king and queen. <coughs> inasmuch as it represents the mystery of the great energy itself upon which all alchemical mutation depends. This mystery is called Azoth. And Azoth is the tremendous power residing in metals by which the transmutation can take place or by which they can be changed or which, by which their lives may be augmented. Seeing the king and queen now, then, as one being, heaven and earth, representing this, uh, this as the solitary and inevitable unity of God itself, we have almost the symbol of the <coughs> tetractus, or the basic triad of life, the king, the queen, and the child the 47th proposition of Euclid, with a slightly different presentation. The next thing we have to realize is that the king, by what we know, 
represents death. And the queen represents matter. And mercury represents soul. Spirit, body, soul. When spirit, body, and soul are brought together into a compound, that compound is called form. Matter is essentially shapeless. Spirit is essentially. <coughs> but when Mercury imposes the archetype upon them, they become a form. Therefore, Mercury was called Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice greatest the master of the three. And this is mysterious power of Hermes is man. Man is manus. Manus is mind. Mind is more, however, than the intellect that we know it, as we know it. So we will take a picture from one of the alchemical writings and we will see Mercury carrying in one hand the sun and in the other hand the moon. He is the juggler of the sun and moon, and it is so represented on a deck of tarot cards. He is the juggler. And Mercury, in this position, bears upon him, or associated with him, the five symbols of the planets, with himself in the middle. That is, the five planets other than the sun and moon known to the ancients. Sometimes Mercury is represented seated in a cave, with six other figures around him, with planets, symbols for heads. <coughs> Mercury, as we go further into the symbolism, obviously represents one thing, it meant, and that is what we call the soul. The soul, which is the juggler of the sun and moon, and which is the ground of reconciliation between spirit and matter which is the power to arbitrate the conflict of consciousness and form, or body. Consciousness in body would die. Body and consciousness could not exist. But soul is the bridge. Soul is the mortar, or the catalyst. The agent, which is the moderator between extremes. All conscious energy moving into form moves through soul and is transformed. All bodily energy moving inward toward consciousness passes through soul and is again transformed. Soul is the modifier, the agent, by which all things are adapted to either their internal or external objectives. So we come again on a psychological level to the problem of the introvert and the extrovert. The extrovert represents consciousness moving through soul into body and into its manifestation outwardly. The introvert is energy moving inward from the objective parts of the consciousness through the soul to the subjective parts. But the soul has to occupy the middle distance because it represents the interpreter of all things. It represents the power which transforms all energies into useful, understandable, or acceptable forms. Therefore, the soul becomes a magician and carries a wand, the wand that is sometimes twisted with the serpent, the symbol of the Magus. The soul is therefore also the messenger of the gods, the Greek concept of Hermes, or the Roman Mercury. The messenger is the one who carries the will of the gods to the world. And therefore, in the alchemical symbolism, it was useful and necessary or proper to represent him by the caduceus, which represented the cerebrospinal and autonomic nervous systems, which are the carriers or messengers of their energy. So consciousness controlling its body has Mercury, its son, to represent it. The body, man's outer life, learning, studying, gaining wisdom and knowledge, seeking to enrich internals, must send this externally accumulated material into consciousness through the messenger, Mercury. 
And the messenger in this case is identical with the little squirrel that used to fly up and down or run up and down the exodusal tree in the Odinic mysteries, carrying the scandals of men to the gods and the scandals of the gods to men. <laughs> It is the messenger power that communicates. Now, why is it that uh, the alchemist felt uh, that this Mercury uh, was able to accept and interpret all metals, or must devour or eat up metals, before it was possible to release the soul of the metal? The answer to the situation was very definite. The alchemist insisted that the metals, which represent on one level of thinking phenomena, or the forms of things as they appear to be, based on <coughs> unpurified, can never be accepted into consciousness. They can never be used to build consciousness. Because before any of these objective things can be useful or necessary and vital to an internal subjective, they must be transformed. The base forms of these metals must die by being absorbed into mercury. And after they have been absorbed and have been reduced to a completely impersonal state, only then does the soul use them to augment its own power. So in one alchemical symbolism, we find Hermes, or Mercury, devouring the metals, eating them, just as John in Revelation ate the little book of knowledge. So the soul, devouring the metals, experience, transforms them into soul power. And the soul power is, of course, the regenerated, reborn metals. Thus we can say what happens to us in life, what we call experience, is not important. It is our acceptance and understanding of that experience that is important. And though that experience passes through a transformation within our own soul life, it contributes nothing to our improvement. There are people that have things happen to them every day and never learn anything. It isn't what happens. It's the power of the soul to transform all external things that makes possible the adaptation of knowledge through internal enlightenment. Through the redemption of the metals. Through the regeneration of the metals. Now, the soul principle, as represented by Mercury, is not only the individual soul, but the world soul. So, if we wish to take the old Trinitarian concept, the Son is God, Saul is the Holy Ghost, and Mercury is the Christ power, the universal soul. And Mercury, as Christ, the catalyst, says, none go unto the Father save by me. In other words, everything that attend, ascends from a material to a spiritual state must pass through soul culture or soul power. And it is in this soul power which is represented by one of the alchemical retorts that by the heat of purification the base elements are withdrawn or caused to pass off, or are uh, incinerated, leaving only the spiritual agent or essence. Man, therefore, does not grow by what happens to him, but by what he does about what happens to him. And this calls upon the power of his own consciousness. You can see easily how what we call realization corresponds to Mercury. Because in realization, the individual is capable of accepting everything into the experience of consciousness and transforming it into truth. Realization is the discovery of the universal in everything. And that is in itself a complete act of catalyzing. 
for the soul of man consisting of two parts, the rational part and the instinctual part, is Mercury. And in this Mercurial age, the great wonders of alchemy are performed. And in the symbol of Mercury, you have the cross, the circle, and the crescent brought together in the planetary symbol and in the chemical symbol of Mercury. Uh, John B., the great uh, English mystic and uh, statesman, wrote a complete, a complete book called The Hieroglyphical Monad, which is devoted entirely to the study of the symbol of Mercury. Because Mercury and its alchemical meaning practically is the key to the entire story of modern psychology. Now we have, therefore, spirit, will, <coughs> the great power of the kingdom. We have the infinite unknown, the tremendous negative power of the queen. Because without the queen, this power never, never releases itself, never manifests itself. And we have equilibrium established between these two, which is Mercury. Therefore, Mercury becomes equilibrium, balance. In the alchemical symbols, we frequently find Mercury holding a pair of scales. It is the equilibrium of forces. For by bringing spirit and matter into equilibrium, uh, the, uh, the positive accomplishment of the soul is assured. Now, in this same symbolism, therefore, Mercury becomes the first and greatest of the Adepts, because Mercury is Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great Hermes, the symbol of the absolute embodiment of all wisdom, in whose name the Hermetic arts were brought into existence. Hermes as the thermoturgic Adept. Is consequently the appropriate and proper symbol of the adept soul in man. Now, the adept soul is the soul which is born again of the union of the king and queen. But this union of the king and queen is by art or nature and not by the primary generation. For when the adept has accomplished the hermetic marriage or the reunion of the king and queen within himself through the instrumentality of Hermes, he is then the adept king. Now this is as much as saying that he has restored the holy empire. He has restored as a philosopher king in Greece the balance and equilibrium of his own existence. He is able, therefore, to bind or to hold or to unite within his own nature in a condition of suspension the two great opposites of existence, spirit and matter. Now, in doing these uh, very interesting things, uh, the adept symbol itself appears <laughs> Now, the adept is usually represented also as two-headed, often by the two-headed eagle, which is his proper animal. The two-headed eagle, in this case, being, of course, a gradual derivation from the original Egyptian phoenix, which was the true eagle. The adept, as the two-headed eagle, has, therefore, the same symbolism as the androgene king-queen, the Ishvara the male-female principle in suspension, the two-headed king-queen, representing the divine power of the Atman itself, is reflected into the adept, who has accomplished the same equilibrium again by will and yoga, or by effort, within his own nature. Now, the adept in the hermetic symbols, of course, is the hero self, to whom all the adventures occur, and whose labor it is forever and eternally uh, to restore the mystery. Thus we have your alchemical symbolism reaching out into practically every different group of fables that we know. St. George and the Dragon, St. George is the adept. The dragon that he is overcoming is the dragon of chaos, the dragon of disorientation, disorganization. 
confusion, ignorance. And your other king, of course, is Sundar the Sailor, performing his twelve mysterious voyages into the unknown and having great and wonderful adventures. The other king is Hercules, performing the twelve labors. Samson, carrying away the gates of Geisha. The only adept king is also Melchizedek, the prince of Salem. Wherever the great and wonderful wise one appears as the man symbol, he is the adept king. The adept king is always the glorified Hermes. He rules with the scepter of the king and queen of the sun and moon. He is a third of the great lights for the sun and moon and man of the great lights of the mysteries. Now, with this basic symbolism, we can see how the alchemist could proceed, could proceed with certain mystical speculation. What other symbols immediately present themselves to our attention? We have to have the symbol of chaos. We have to have the symbol of the thing that must be overcome. And therefore, we extend our thinking on the subject of base metals which represent, to a degree, the chaos. Therefore, it is not impossible for us to recognize the meaning of seeing a great stormy sea, in the midst of which is an ark, like the Ark of Noah, and on the deck of the ark, an alchemical bottle. In other words, the alchemy floating on the sea of chaos. The Ark of Noah, which contains within itself all the germs of life for the replenishment of the earth, is an alchemical symbol, if you want to see it that way. Then we have also, in another case, the bottle in the ark, with a dove flying out of it, carrying a little bit of green in its beak. The dove is an alchemical symbol, in this case. We have accepted it as a symbol of promise, as a symbol of the restoration of faith, and of peace, and of the return of life to the world. But the dove is an alchemical emblem. And wherever it appears, it is a soul symbol. Now, in another kind of alchemy, we can have monsters, griffins of all kinds. But your base substance, your body, <coughs> your corrupt material from which all of these things are derived, must always represent crude matter, or its equivalent. <coughs> crude, undeveloped consciousness within a living thing, this consciousness existing in a state of total ignorance. Now, if you will go back to the legends of the Trojan War, you will find the references to the ancient city of Elim, which comes from the word Elus, meaning slime or mud, from which all things are supposed to have come forth in the beginning of life. Even science is inclined to take a little bad action in the generation of living things. But they came out of primordial ooze and mud, or the slime of a prehistoric world. Therefore, in Alchemy, we have a monster, a strange lizard like thing, not the salamander of fire, but a strange creature that lives in ooze and mud and corruption. <laughs> a kind of a bagimal, a leviathan, uh, that must be attacked by Murdoch and slain with the sword of light and will. Here we have also Fatna in the Nordic mythology, sleeping and guarding the cave of the Nibelungen traitor. And his only remark is, let me sleep. Uh, the, uh, the dragon of chaos. Then, as you watch this dragon of chaos, you see <coughs> or Merodach, or Tammuz, or whichever one of the deities you wish to think, Adonis, all of them, coming down with the sword, armed with light, bearing the shield of power, and slaying the dragon, slaying the dragon of chaos. Now, let's uh, think just for a moment now of what this might possibly mean. Probably most of us have never taken a very careful examination of our own uh, psychological interiors. We do not realize that in some instances, each one of us 
has within us a substratum of negative psychic material, which is this ulos, or slime. <coughs> this slime, or corruption, within our own psychic life, which is forever breeding and sustaining and nourishing this dark monster, this monster of negation, which is the root of the negative impulses of all man's psychic activity. And so the individual, bringing the sword of light and striking into the dark mystery of his own subjective, to slay the negative monster that lurks there, is Mercury performing one of his great alchemical labors, of which there are many. Though the elus or the slime, the corruption of things, is represented in this way, there is another very interesting symbolism that has to come into the into this particular purpose. And that is the symbol of death. In alchemy, the symbol of death is found in the bottles. We see the metals calcinated. We see things which, unless they die, cannot be born again. So that as the seed cannot live unless first it dies, so in alchemy, all liberation is death. And everything is released by death. The uh, alchemical formula on this is rather important, so we'll pause for a moment to try to estimate it a little bit. All things in a living state are locked. The consciousness within a form is locked by that form completely. It can never break through that form without first reducing the form. Alchemy does not assume that it is possible for a structure containing a compound of ignorance and wisdom, that is, pure and base matter, can be taken at any particular point and immediately advance to a superior state. Everything that seeks to grow by alchemy must first die. Because while it is in a state of generation, its parts are inseparable and cannot be divided. During life, consciousness and body cannot be divided. By death only are they, are they divided. So alchemy says that only by the phenomenon of death can the matter be divided from their base and their subtle parts. Now this doesn't mean, the alchemist certainly did not mean that an individual who is separate and baser and better parts must go out and shoot himself. They did not mean that in any sense of the way. What they meant was that all growth comes from the dying of something. Or you can have a, a new idea and only one has to die. You cannot accept an idea if you are satisfied with the one you have. If you want to grow, you've got to give up something. If you want to proceed, the past must die. If you want to be more than you are, something that is less must perish all along the way. You cannot start upon this great search, bound and locked within the structure of your own opinion. Your opinions have to die before there's any room in you for truth. Everything has to be reduced to its essentials. And the essential of everything is seed and ashes. Seed and ashes, says the alchemist. The seed that cannot die, which is the king, and the ashes which must die. So everything must be reduced by putrefaction, by the disintegration of its parts to essential material. For, says the alchemist, all of the metals in their essential nature will combine to form the stone or the medicine. But once the metals have bodies, they can never combine. So material gold, material silver, and material copper will never combine. The only way you can combine them is through the agent of mercury, which destroys their bodies and releases their principles. Or, as the alchemist would like to put it more correctly, if you take these spirits out of bodies, the spirits will unite, but the bodies cannot. So are the same of man. 
the essential life principles of all creatures are compatible. But their personalities and their vehicles of manifestation are not compatible. Thus all things in their purity can be united. And all things in their impurity cannot be united. As the alchemist also says, at the beginning of things, all was one. At the end of things, all will be one. In the middle distance between beginning and end, there will be many. And while the state of many exists, this manyness can never be brought together. The only way in which many can become one again is to have the vehicles or bodies destroyed. The principles have always been one. But as long as these principles are locked within symbolic forms, these forms will never unite. They will come near together, but they can never perform as the alchemy of fusing or becoming identical or to lose themselves in a new substance. And here is again the great, one of the great secrets of alchemy. The seven metals or the seven substances representing the testimonies of the seven senses or the seven powers of the soul. <clears throat> when they unite in the soul, they produce something entirely separate and different from themselves. And an H2O does not represent H2 or O separately, but produces a new thing, differing in appearance and essential nature from its own parts. So in alchemy, when the seven metals are brought together, they do not produce a lump of seven metals. They produce a new being, completely different. And when the compound is correctly measured and estimated, the result is an entirely new being, separate and distinct, in which there is no longer any trace of the parts which made it. If you bring the material substances together by artificial means and form a statue with them, you can always divide them again, under heat or under something, under some means. That mercury will usually divide them again. But, in alchemy, when the seven essences have been brought together, there is an entirely new existence created. And that new existence is different from anything that preceded it. And this thing that is created by the alchemy of the union of matters is actually the human soul. And the human soul was called the Orgulus, or the crystal child uh, that is born out of the alchemical retort, <laughs> the great glass womb of chemistry. For it is the purpose of alchemy to create a living thing. And uh, this living thing, or the Orgulus, is a generation of art and nature. And the alchemist who performs this mystery plays God, or he creates. Now he will tell you himself that alchemy is nothing more or less than man's keen observation of natural progress. <coughs> Being man watching as Paracelsus watched the miners at work, the mines of the Fugas. <coughs> Watching the processes, studying the way in which coal and diamonds come into existence. Or in China, the mystery of amber, locking within itself the tiny insect of a prehistoric world. Man studying nature discovers the mystery of soul. Now in this mystery, which is called in alchemy the homunculus, we have the same mystery that is called in Chinese metaphysics the transcendent beings. And the homunculus is the new creature that is formed out of the seven souls or seven natures of man. <coughs> Just as surely, as he, as he generates his kind by male and female, by the union of the kingdom queen, of a psychic and spiritual power within his own nature, so he generates himself or generates a being out of himself. 
which is called the Homunculus, and has its parallel in the story of Melchizedek, who was his own father and his own mother, if you remember, the Prince of Peace. So this being that is its own father and its own mother is adequately and properly represented in alchemy by one of the supreme symbols of the achievement, and that is the phoenix. Because the phoenix is the bird which gives birth to itself out of itself. So the phoenix, which lives for 500 years, according to the Egyptian legend, came to the time when it must die. It retired to a, an altar of flame in one of the temples, and there, in a nest of fire, its body broke open, and the new phoenix issued from it. And there was never but one phoenix alive at a time. Now this is our chemical symbolism with a bit of vengeance, and it tells us a great deal, because this phoenix allegory returns to us again in China. The phoenix, of course, is the self-generated being in which the seven powers of the metals, having been invaded by a process of generation, create within themselves an immortal being. So in the uh, story of mankind, you know the gods and you know mortals. And you know the gods live forever and mortals have their sorrows for a day. There's a story in India about some people who live in the New Jersey Hills who uh, belong to a community or a nation or a race in which nobody is ever born. Now that's a kind of a curious thought. Because this little community is composed of persons born everywhere who go there for certain reasons. Therefore, it's no one's born there theoretically. It is a race that is composed of persons who have certain peculiarities or distinction about themselves, coming from anywhere, because they are alike in this mysterious manner, go there. Now this legend and uh, certain of the factors involved in it is the, again, very much the story. You know the hero is a very, very interesting being. <laughs> you know in the legends and the myths about these beings, we have something that is very strange to us. Something that is born and never dies. Now that breaks both the rules of common sense and is well, well known to uh, uh, the old days of theological doubts and misgivings as the famous Methodist one in its stick. To hear and talk about that, forever theological controversies get long. Somebody's born as a beginning, and then goes on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. ever. Whether here, in heaven, or below. Something that has a beginning in time has no end in eternity. It becomes a sort of a one-ended stick. Which is quite a controversial issue. Well, I mean, actually, there is a one-ended stick. And that one-ended stick is the homunculus, the soul power, the soul being. Because the soul is something that has a beginning, but no end. And Bailey was one of the first to recognize this in interesting and remarkable phenomenon. Your soul, as the adept king, is generated within man by the mingling and chemistry of intuition and reason, of wisdom and love and of the polarities of the soul power in their form of the king of Queen. The soul, therefore, has its own world ruled over by the king who is wisdom and the queen who is love. And wisdom, the king, is the master of the show and he is always seeking the unknown love, which is the queen. And without which he cannot fulfill himself. So here again, you can take love away from him, you can capture the queen on the chessboard, but again you cannot capture the king. All these symbols refer back again. But in the soul, wisdom and love unite to produce a being. And this being has a beginning, but no end. And this being is the source of immortality, because the king and the queen Spirit and man, 
are not bound together by an eternal union. They must always be the result of a compound. And as God may have asked to have inscribed upon his tomb, <coughs> let all compounds be dissolved. Life and matter are polarities of each other. And their relations to each other are eternally impermanent. Therefore, spirit and matter meet and separate. And that which is purely of its own nature returns to itself. And that which is of an opposing nature returns to its own source. The thing that binds them is nature, the emotions, or the hermetic addict. And it is the addict then, or the addict self, the transcendent being of China, that creates its own immortality by binding its own seven souls together into one immortal being. And this progeny of the sun and moon, of heaven and earth, of spirit and matter, is born by art, but never dies. Because that is man's earned immortality, or earned eternal existence. He exists eternally as spirit and matter forever. Nothing can ever stop that. But he exists eternally as a conscious being only when he creates the soul or creates or provides the great alchemical experience. Now in Eastern philosophy, they would go even a little further than that. They would say that once having created the adept soul, that even that must ultimately renounce its own immortality. And therefore, again, the hero of the world dies always, usually in the service of great love, searching again for the unknown queen. The symbolism is very adroitly used. It is exceedingly subtle. You can draw some tremendous tapestries with it, always because of the wonderful interworking of rules and principles and laws. But the soul, now, which is St. Paul's wedding garment, the soul is the eternal or immortal self, the transcendent being, born of the marriage of heaven and earth. It is, however, not merely man as a form or structure. Primitive man is building the soul. The soul began to build when man was created. And step by step, it has taken over the inner control of him. And so the day he is controlled by his emotions and his thoughts, which are the present developed state of his soul. But, says alchemy, in this method, by nature a law alone. The path is very long, and along the way the soul has been very sick. It has become utterly confused, and the path of its final restoration by nature means that man must slowly work out through trial and error, through joy and sorrow, through life and death, every inconsistency of his own psychic life. This project suggests millions of years. It suggests thousands of lives, perhaps. The day by day, step by step, exhaust the errors of the soul and experience every good thing in spite of our effort we made, in spite of our own resistance to grow, a resistance which itself must gradually be overcome through a great series of time and sorrow. So Alfred says, Ah, for a perfect nature. Man becoming a priest in the great chemical laboratory of the universe will uh, cooperate voluntarily and will assist nature in the perfection of the soul. So he says to the individual, very much as Mercury, the Christos, the anointing oil, the symbol of the transmutation, says that if you would be the disciple of truth, be as a little child. Here, is Mercury destroying the metals. Here is the sword breaking up the patterns. Here is the death of an old self, the death of an opinionation which we have long called ourselves. The acceptance of the fact that we are ignorant 
So we think we are wise, which is the death of Adam. And that's one of the most magnificent extinctions of all. <laughs> one of the most difficult So here also stands a figure, the villain of the play, with the mortgage in one hand, the symbol of the angel, which in the alchemical art is all present as a kind of adversary as a kind of power that seeks to destroy the work. So the destruction of the great work, <coughs> the great adept experiment, by the angel comes into consideration. And the villain plays his role to try to prevent the consummation of the magnum opus. But the work of the creation of the seventh soul, or the soul of life, goes on in the uh, alchemical mystery. In uh, Ashmole's The Artum Chemical Pretendium, which is one of the great English collections of alchemical works, we have the horoscope of the great work, showing the moment in time of the birth of the Adept King. His nativity is properly calculated. Another book equally interesting has the original, true, and undoubtable horoscope of Adam. It is quite conceivable. Not because we have the slightest idea of what Adam was born, and ever will. But Adamus is another name for the base metal, the, the base substances from which the metals are taken. So we find Adam appeared in the alchemical retort. We have Eve appeared in the alchemical retort. Adam is again the king, and Eve is the <coughs> mystery, the eternal quest of the underworld. So in the alchemical rites also, we, we find the restoration of the Virgin Sophia, from the Gnosis, and from the great systems of wisdom. And uh, we have in the chemical marriage of Christian Rosenkreutz, uh, the Virgin Lucifera, the mysterious soul counterpart of Lucifer. These are all alchemical, alchemical used symbols. But they all tell us of the creation of the soul power, which is the victory of man. Now, in one very interesting uh, symbolism, which I have seen in alchemy, there is a series of 64 bottles, which is an interesting number because it corresponds exactly with the development of the Chinese trigrams. In each of these 64 bottles, is an episode of the white Christ, called in the perfect circle. And here, in these episodes of the life of Christ, each incident is marked with the alchemical symbols, so that you will know exactly what is referred to. And the theory behind the whole concept is that Christ is this imperishable seventh soul, the power of immortality. And that that individual who follows in the way indicated, who takes up the cross and follows the Master through the 64 augmentations of the material, as it is called, will also achieve the resurrection. And in the last bottle, as a symbol of the consummation of the great work, the creation of the divine soul, we see the figure of Christ carrying the banner on the staff, rising in the midst of life from the grave the resurrection. And this resurrection is the rebirth of the beings. The entire cycle reminds us of Paul's words, the Christ in you, which is the hope of glory. For to the alchemist, Christ is the symbol of the soul, the mystery of the soul, the soul that is born in the manger, surrounded by beasts, the soul that must pass through certain vicissitudes, be crucified and die, to be raised from the dead before it can live again. And exactly what occurs in that allegory is told in the story of the death and resurrection of the sea and the ground. For well, this is the parable. The sea is the word of God. And Alchemy says, the seeds of the metals are the seeds of immortality. In this way, the soul mystery in Alchemy is unfolded and its true purpose is the integration of the soul as a living vehicle within which a new being, the Son of Heaven and Earth, 
to have a real and conscious life. This is the adept self, the reborn, the twice or thrice born Hermes. In this same symbolism we come across a number of other very intriguing uh, things for thought. We have the tree of the metals. We have the Saturn from us, the old one-legged gardener walking on a crutch. And we have him carefully watering the tree upon which grow the seven metals in the form of flowers and fruit. This is the tree of alchemy. This is also represented in another form as a tree with twelve bears bearing a fruit upon it. In this case, watered by the same old man with the opposite leg crippled, and this time the tree bearing on it the twelve signs of the zodiac as fruit. The twelve signs of the zodiac, incidentally, represent the twelve steps or mutations which are repeated in cycles to produce the augmentation of the stone. For the stone at the beginning is very weak, and it must be repeatedly augmented, cycle after cycle, until it increases in strength. This is because man, in the practice of truth, is at first very weak and infirm. But by continuous repetition, or the continuous recollection of reality, it constantly increases within himself through the contemplated disciplines. It's the same thing exactly. Well, we have two trees, one with seven levels and one with twelve <coughs> signs of the zodiac. And one is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is the tree of the world. <coughs> and the other is the tree of life, which bears the twelve manner of fruits, which are for the healings of the nations. And if you will look down at the bottom of the tree of life, you will find lying in the ground beneath it. The king and queen buried together, and from their body the tree rising. Because from the union of heaven and earth rises the tree of life. But the tree of the metals, or the soul, the seven blossoms on that tree, are watered and taken care of by Saturn, the old god of contemplation, the punisher, the destroyer, the principle of karma, the retribution, and discipline, the old one legged gardener is self-discipline by which the tree of the soul is supposed to bear its fruit. So each little story is a little gem in itself, telling things about all these moral mysteries. But with it all, let us not forget that Roger Bacon is said to have gone to the King of England and offered to finance by a man-made gold the crusade. Gold was made. <coughs> now, how and why was gold made? <coughs> the gold makers actually did cause the precipitation of metals. And there are examples in European museums, some of which I have seen, of man made gold. Not made at the expense of $50,000 an ounce. That's what we try to do something to that kind of money. Uh, scientifically, we can make gold, but not on a profitable basis. <laughs> Of course, it goes up much higher, so they get to be profitable. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why the alchemist was able to make gold was because he had learned something. He had learned that the same power which makes soul operates on, a, on an archetype. That the soul represents an artificial gold, a synthetic gold and that it can't be manufactured, as man manufactures his own destiny. And in the same way, by the same laws, the metals, the physical metals, can be handled. But in order to handle them, as Nicholas by now points out, you must kill the metals. You must actuate the fall of the physical state, the death and resurrection of the metals. You kill the metals. You take cover, Iron, tin, mercury. You take these and you learn how to absolutely destroy them. And when you have completely destroyed them, you have released by that means from them a universal essence which permeates them all. Then he 
if you know how, you can restore that pattern according to the element that you desire. But you cannot do it while iron is iron, or zinc is zinc, or copper is copper. It must first be reduced to a common denominator. And the discovery of the common denominator uh, applies to many things. Today we have a problem in connection with common denominators. When we have Japanese and Chinese and Hindu and Greeks and Persians and Jews, we are never going to have brotherhood of man. We can. But we can only have that brotherhood of man when we destroy the differences and discover the reality. We have got to go back and down through and remove all these layers of separateness and form the unity and then build upon it, we will have one people. That's the same principle exactly as the alchemical experiment. We cannot take things in their various degrees of development and synthesize them. You've got to reduce them to their basic principle. That's why you practically have to reduce the human being to extend it if one teaches anything. It is only when he says to himself, I am a complete failure, that he begins to have a little hope of succeeding. <laughs> when he says to himself, I don't know what to do next, then he will begin to think. Because he has reduced himself to his basic element by rejecting and renouncing his own confusion and error. So in alchemy and in all departments, including chemistry itself, the reduction of these elements to their basic element makes possible their restoration in a new and important integration or into a new chemical substance, which can be augmented then by cycles until its particular purpose is attained. Soul can be made. And it is no more ridiculous than saying soul can be made. Yet most people do not believe or realize that a soul can be made. They believe they have it. That it's something that is conferred upon it. And yet the culture of development and perfection of the soul is one of the greatest of all the arts. And in alchemy, the soul is tremendously important because it becomes the living body of the being. It becomes the basis of the being born from itself. The old man who dies in darkness and is born in light. So we have an interesting situation arise. The king is said to die. The king being a uh, spirit, a divine power. The king, is, is the king died. And why does the king die? Because he is slain by an evil power, the ogre, which of course is chaos, confusion. The absolute absorption of the king into the universe, or life completely uh, absorbed in phenomena, and thereby no longer recognizable in its own nature. But, the king comes to life again through his own son, or in his own son. And you go right back to your legend of Osiris, the Egyptian ritual. And you will find in Plutarch's description of the death and resurrection of Osiris, that after the death of Osiris, he overshadowed as a holy spirit his sister wife, Isis, and she bare Horus, the symbol of the Messianic soul. <coughs> And when the child was born, her own brother husband entered into the body of the child. Therefore, he was his own father, certainly, in that particular case. This child was a widow's son, because he was born after his father had his letter. And this child, of course, was not the same <coughs> father only, but was his father by a mystery of transubstantiation. Therefore, a horse, <coughs> or a Christ, said, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. For the Father is in me, and I am in the Father, and the Father and I are one. And that was held to be an, an implication uh, that Jesus, as a human being, considered himself God, which was not the implication at all. 
from the soul, virtue, becomes the embodiment of his own father. And the divine power of heaven, the spirit, reborn through soul, becomes the new being, the new king of heaven and earth. And this new king is the perfected or enlightened or redeemed resurrected man in whom all the mysteries of the universe have been perfected in the marriage of the metals, which are the parts or the symbols of all the structures that go together to form the vehicle of the soul. This is again the famous garment of glory of the high priests of Israel. For each of the garments that bear the breastplate the urim and thummim and all the vestments represent the adornments and jewels of the soul. Here also is the ecclesia of the early Christian dispensation, the church. For if you remember that it is the church adorned as a bride who is united in eternal marriage to the Lamb. The church adorned as a bride is, of course, a symbol of man's assembly of parts or the psychic nature with its reunion with God. So the uh, symbolism goes on and on. And in alchemy we have a book which is called the Book Seal the Seven Seals, which is based upon the Book of Revelation and unfolds all the mysteries of Revelation under the seals of the seven metals. <coughs> we have all these emblems used constantly and inevitably to reveal one story, namely that man must create his own immortal soul by art. That this soul is the diamond of the mind. And that who builds a soul builds an imperishable self that has a new being. And uh, the old man passes away and then the man comes. And in this new being, he had that self man claims his immortality because he can be separated into parts and so he fuses these parts himself into the great psychic entity which is called the soul which then becomes his real self is born from him as a transcendent being and gradually gains an existence apart from him and there's the mysterious Megos or the mysterious Rishi uh, the great wonder worker the Mahatma for the great soul is the reborn soul, main of the seven souls, described in Egypt. And if you want to know the meaning of the, of the elements of the metals, you will find that the seven elements of the soul used in alchemy are found in Egypt, where they form part of one section of the Book of the Dead. But it is the combining of the seven souls that perish to form the one imperishable soul, which is the atomic soul, or the soul of the magician the wonder worker, who becomes his own father, who is reborn through his own son, who becomes the symbol of the true Hermes, uh, the Adam And in him, all that was and is and ever shall be is resurrected. And he is then the loved son, and he is the prodigal son who has returned to his father's house. All these symbols tie together in one terrific pattern. Next week we'll do some more with them, but I'm afraid if we do much more tonight, you'll never get all these 